All right, so let's see. We're going to talk about the biochemistry a little bit so we can work our way into a lot of the health issues. And uh, that's where I'm going to start today. some terms. I'll hit them one by one. First of all, calories. And carbohydrates. Followed by lipids. Proteins. Fats. Well, fat comes out of lipids, the type of lipid, and enzymes. Won't cover all of these today, but I'll definitely cover quite a few of these. For this tour. So, how much food is needed? by humans. And when I say how much food is needed by humans, there's also how much food is needed by the animals and how much food is needed by everything else on this planet. So, let's talk about that. In the 1970s, there were many discussions or talks about running out of food. Now, there might have only been like 3 billion people or so on this planet. I've got to check exactly how many. And today we have 8 billion people who we don't talk about running out of food. That's an odd thing. There's a reason for that. If you go to Europe, they, and I'll say they as many of them, they don't like Genetically modified food. They often want organic food. Organic food is whole process of food. I mean, you could talk about being pure organic with no pesticides, no anything, um, no, um, no modifying the actual plant or the seeds, but um, it costs a lot more money most of the time. And if you have organically raised animals, like if you raise chickens, when I was young, I grew up on a chicken farm and we had, uh, geez, a hundred and we had a hundred meat birds and you know, 100 laying birds and 50 meat birds. And we, at the end of the year, would kill 50 meat birds at first. And then uh, we'd kill 100 laying birds uh, after they had uh, gone into molt for their first set of eggs. But either way, my whole life, I thought chicken was extremely tough stuff. And then when I left my house, we had never been, I, I grew up very sheltered. Um, until I was 18, I'd never been to McDonald's or anything like that. I grew up 30 miles from the ocean. I never saw the ocean. So it was really strange, the last of nine children. Um, when I tried processed food, I couldn't believe chicken was so soft. 
And then I found out later it's because they're raised in these tiny cages and their muscles aren't getting a chance to move. So I always thought chicken was like rip and tear, really tough stuff. Well, if you buy organic food, it's often harder to eat sometimes because it's like the animals actually had a decent life outside in the sun. Getting past that, in the 1970s, we were quite sure we were going to run out of food. You could look up all the old movies, etc. And then scientists changed food to make it produce more fruit and have less insects eat it. And once you did that, once we genetically modified the food, there was a guy in the 1970s, uh, President, President Kennedy was killed, no, 1960s. President Kennedy was killed in the 1960s, but his brother Bobby Kennedy famously did an Appalachia tour out here in the Appalachian area and looked at all the starving American children. And there were a lot of starving American children. Now, the problem is if you're poor, you're eating so much processed food, you're often not starving in this country, other countries you still are. But uh, in this country, you're often not starving, but you have overnutrition and you get the diabetes and all that kind of stuff. So there's all these kind of issues people get from that. But to make a long story short, um, once they genetically modified the food, they were changing the actual plant enough that insects didn't like to taste it anymore and that they would produce tons and tons of fruit. So now, famously, it was declared the problem was solved and we could feed 20 billion people. So we were running out of food with 3 billion people. We only had like one to two billion a hundred years before that. And now we said famously, geez, with this genetically modified food, we could feed 20 billion people. Well, that became an issue because then all of a sudden nobody cared about um, how many children people were having anymore. And when people had a lot more children, if you think about it, as I've told you before, every four and a half days, there's one million more people net on this planet. You're never going to solve global warming anything until we figure out um, what we will do about our population. And we kind of have to go to Mars or some other place. But in Europe, they don't like that. They want to be able to just like have food is completely organic. But if you had completely organic food, we'd be starving again on this planet. So it's a push and a pull. I'm making the Europeans sound kind of backwards. They're not really backwards. Maybe they're much healthier people. I'll tell you something they think differently about. which is something we have covered a bit. We heat milk in America to pasteurize it. To kill bacteria. But this does not kill spores. So it doesn't kill baby bacteria. So I often think about if somebody cooked your food properly, if you have stomach issues, a lot of times you're eating bad food, you just don't realize it. But if someone could cook your food properly, they've killed off all the live bacteria, but they haven't killed the spores. And when you put it on a salad bar and you put it in a wet environment and you put this nice warm heat lamp on it, at some point, the bacteria will grow from the spores back to a very dangerous level. So in America, we pasteurize our milk, which means we heat it up to kill the spores and we put a date on it. So this is kind of important to me. 
you look at the milk and they say sell by this date and something is always found in like the refrigerated sections of america in europe milk can be on a shelf so no refrigeration And it might be very confusing to you. What do they do? They hit the milk with radiation. And that kills bacteria and spores. So they hit the milk with radiation and that kills bacteria spores and then they seal it. Once they seal it, there's no reason to have to put it into a refrigerator and you can put a very long date on there. It's gonna last a very long time. What you have to realize is once you open this milk, you allow new bacteria in and you start a clock. Just like with our milk, which we have to throw out much more often, okay? Uh, with our milk, we just put a date on it from the moment that we pasteurize it. And we say, if, if nobody drinks this by a certain date, it's going to be bad. I really want you to realize this, that um, first of all, when you hit something with radiation, you're not making a radioactive. You could hit me with a lot of radiation and I may never be able to have children and you might actually kill me at some point, but I'm not going to be able to make a Geiger counter tick. I'm not going to exude radiation. I'm just going to be extremely sick from too much radiation. So if you hit the milk with radiation, let's say it has like a five month um, date on there, it doesn't mean you can open it and then drink it for like five months because it's gonna start getting bacteria. So I'm starting to see some milk in America, uh, especially because of all the online shipping and things like that, that must be using that process. Like when you go to a store these days, you might see milk that at the date like months away. But understand, if you open it, it doesn't mean you can leave it open in your refrigerator for months. They probably should explain that to you. So what do I want from this talk? I definitely want you to know about the genetically modified food. I want you to understand how, uh, the Euro bit of an essay here, how the Europeans um, are kind of against genetically modified food, but they think we're kind of crazy how much milk we waste because they irradiate and they realize the radiation is not going to you know, hurt them in any way, shape or form. Where we, because I guess we've dropped the nuclear bombs, we really are afraid of radiation. We still can't get the Americans that like the idea of a radiator. Okay, that takes care of the beginning of your lecture. Let's look next to my notes. Ah, so the term calories, yeah, gotta go into that. Erasing the whole thing. All right, it's a very old term. One calorie. And that's a small letter C. It's not a large letter C. One calorie of heat is enough to raise the temperature. of one gram of H2O by one degree Celsius. It doesn't mean it's perfect. The density of water is one as well. We just base everything on, is it, uh, how does it compare to water? We make water the standard. So one calorie of heat is enough heat to weigh is one gram and one gram of water is also one milliliter if you're curious of H2O. If you had a small box that was one milliliter by, I'm sorry, one milli, one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter, if you want to get the volume, that would be one centimeter cubed or one cc. In a hospital, they call milliliters 
because if you filled this box with water, one mill of water would fill in it. They call milliliters often, give the person five cc's, give the person five milliliters. How fast does it drip, et cetera? So anyway, one calorie of heat is enough heat to raise the temperature by one degree, uh, temperature of water, one gram of it by one degree. What can we do with that? Well, you don't burn calories. Now notice I wrote a capital C. You don't burn calories. You burn food and you get heat from it. 80% of your food goes to heating you. That's because you're warm-blooded. If you look at a cold-blooded animal like a snake, it doesn't have to eat that often because you know it doesn't need to spend all of its temperature, all of its time trying to get itself up to a certain temperature. So 80% of your food goes to heating you, but you don't burn calories, you burn food to get energy. You burn food to, so calories are a unit of energy. Now, 1,000 chemistry calories equals one capital calorie. So technically that's one kilo, C-A-L-O-R-I-E. We developed calories long before we developed uh, the need to put calories on food. It was just a, something we used in math uh, to figure out heat. If you went back 100 years um, in the stores, if you bought meat, you bought meat. It didn't say how many calories you got. People didn't care about that. So when we decided that we would have to figure out calories, let's say something is 120 calories per serving. So that's always depressing. Like you get a bag of chips and it's a small bag of chips and it says it has three servings and you're like, oh my God, it's 360 calories in this. So 120 calories per serving in the chemistry world, when they probably first asked us to write calories on there, well, that's 120,000 regular chemistry calories. And because the ad agencies probably didn't think Americans wanted to hear that they ate 120,000 calories. They said, just divide it by 1,000 and make it a kilocalorie. But then they said, look, we don't like the metric system. Don't make anything a kilo. And they said, okay, 1,000 calories will be one capital calorie, which we call a dietary calorie. Anyway, that's what's on your food bag. And it gets measured. How do you measure how many calories something has? Well, I'll show you. It's based on one of the laws of thermodynamics. The original energy, I think it's the first law, but the original energy is not created or destroyed. Uh, of the Big Bang is the energy that everything's using. We get our energy from the sun, X, if you're wondering, but the energy of the entire universe came from the Big Bang. So we'd say heat, which is often a Q, okay? Heat lost by system equals heat gained by surroundings. So in science, we'd say that energy is conserved. How do we use that to measure calories of food? It's very basic. Here's what we do. First of all, water has a specific heat time capacity. And it's really high. Much higher than iron, for example. If you had an iron pan with an iron handle and you held onto the iron handle and put it on your burner at home, whatever you want to call your burner, it could be electric, it could be any other thing that actually makes heat for you, you wouldn't be able to hold it very long. It doesn't mean that that iron has a high heat capacity. 
it means it can't hold heat, it travels right through it and burns your hand. But the expression for boiling water, you know, this is me boiling some water, a watched kettle never boils. That just means it takes a long time to heat it up. You'll, you'll be surprised if you wanted to make some ramen at home and you have a stove with like fire, you could go to your microwave and heat it up or you could use a stove and it's just as fast because to make a long story short, the water takes forever to heat up. It's the reason we have a temperate climate on this planet. If you were to, like if you live 20 miles inland from the ocean, if it's zero degrees outside and freezing, it'll be 32 on the beach. And the reason for that is the giant bucket of water, the ocean doesn't allow a big change and water in its liquid form can't be any lower than 32 Fahrenheit. In the same respect, people like to live by the ocean. Um, if you were inland 30 miles from the ocean and you had 100 degrees, you could go 30 miles to the ocean and it's going to be like 85 because the ocean's huge heat capacity is moderating things. Parts of the country where you don't have huge heat capacity, I'm sorry, where you don't have a lot of water, the temperatures in a desert will go up to 100, down to 50, major changes, down to 40 even at night, because there's no water to moderate it. Here, in where we are right now, uh, you definitely have rivers and stuff, so it's much nicer. So how do you measure the calories of food? Well, let's say, you took a paper clip and you put on this paper clip a walnut. And then you suspend it with a ring stand, let's say 100 milliliters of H2O. And you take the temp. So here's how you do it. This is the simplest way to do it, the way we did in the lab last week uh, for anybody who actually actually does this lab, if you're doing this in a live classroom setting. Uh, this would be figuring out the calories in food. You take something like a walnut, you weigh it, like a serving size might be 28 walnuts, okay? And that's what's gonna be on the bag. But you take one walnut, you weigh it, you have the weight of 100 grams of water, 100 mils of water, and then you take a match, and you light it on fire. Now, if you were to take a carrot or a piece of celery, better yet a carrot, and you took a match and tried to light it, the minute you take the match away, it's not going to stay lit, okay? If you light a walnut, you get a nice flame for five minutes. Any, that's a good rule for you to have in life. I want you to know this rule. If you look at your food, if you have food that can catch on fire in your oven, like a grease fire, it's probably high in fat, high in calories. If you have food that would never catch on fire, it's probably low in fat, low in calories. So you say the Q is heat, Q lost by food equals Q gained by water. Now in chemistry, Lost is going to be negative. I lost something. It's going to be equal and opposite, and this is going to get hotter. So the temperature of the water, let's say it was at, oh, I don't know, 17 degrees Celsius, and it goes up to 25 degrees Celsius. All of that temperature change is basically because you lit some food on fire. And there's something you can do with math, which we're not going to make you do, but the specific heat capacity of water can be used to figure out exactly how many calories you got for this many grams of nut. But this is not a perfect system, so I want to explain that to you. If I had you in an actual room, I'd say, did all the heat from the wall not get into that water? And hopefully you would respond and you'd say no, probably somewhat in this direction. Probably some heated up this metal and that's lost. Maybe the glass got hot. So it's not a perfect system. We need a perfect system. We need a much better thing. 
This thing is called, um, the whole kind of math is called C-A-L-O-R-I-M-E-T-R-Y, calorimetry. It's like the math you use to figure out the calories in the food, calorimetry. That's a bad calorimeter. But it's a nice experiment for students. They enjoy lighting walnuts and almonds and stuff on fire. But if you buy in your store some carrots, it's going to have an actual amount of calories on the back. They must not have done this experiment, but they must have burned the, cal uh, the carrots. So here's what you use. First of all, you want that water to get all the heat and not to lose any of the heat. So you take a box and you have a known set amount of water. Inside the box, you have this container that you can fill with oxygen gas. Oxygen gas is going to burn for you if you put a spark, okay? So you can fill it and pressurize it. You can pressurize it. With oxygen gas. Now you don't want the temperature of this water to leak out, so you put this thing inside like a styrofoam or an insulated jacket. Insulated jacket, styrofoam, something you would use if you're trying to keep food at home, a cooler you'd call it, but this is like a really good insulated jacket. And then on top of here, you have a lid. And inside of here, you have a temperature thermometer. You take the original temperature of the water, you pressurize this with O2, you send a spark, and this amount of water, let's say, H2O goes up by two degrees Celsius. Let's say the H2O goes up by two degrees Celsius every single time you actually pressurize the canister inside of this device, this calorimeter. What you do after that is you say, well, any rise in temperature above two degrees would be for something else burning. So then you put food in here with the O2. Whatever you put inside of there is going to burn. Only because it's an explosion at that point. It's just not getting out. So you put food inside of there. So let's say you put, I don't know, a walnut or a carrot. And let's say you put like two grams of walnut or two grams of carrot. The carrot doesn't burn as well. So the temperature, so temp might go up by five degrees. So five minus two degrees, that comes from the oxygen, equals three degrees, and we can do math with this to figure out the calories in two grams of carrot. If you burn the water, temp might go up by 12 degrees because the walnut has more fat in it. The Walmart is going the Walmart. The walnut is going to burn a lot longer. So to make a long story short, 12 minus 10, I'm sorry, minus two from the O2 equals 10 degrees. You take this 10 degrees, do that little bit of math we're not doing, and you can figure out the amount of heat that's given off by the walnut, and you can write on the bag the amount of calories. So what is this called? Something I want you to explain to me. This is a bomb calorimeter. Why is it called a bomb calorimeter? Because some food you just can't light on fire, you have to explode it. 
And what our students do is in class with a real bomb calorimeter, they put too many Cheetos in here and the whole thing blows up. It's kind of like interesting in the junior, senior year of chemistry. So we burn food. You can get a job burning food for a living if you want to do that. The calories talk is pretty much done. And the calories talk, uh, now we got to actually talk about the different foods. So this is done. And by the way, that was capital calories. Going to a race, looking at the clock, carbohydrates, we started those already. So let me go back into that. We started because we were doing the plastics chapter. And circle and name the functional groups. At this point in the course, people have circled and named functional groups. If I had you live, I'd be able to ask you to do those things. So let me draw a molecule for you. Right, so C double bond O H. Each one of these crosses, one, two, three, four, is a carbon atom. That's a carbon atom. Down here in the bottom is C H two O H, and then I'll do O H O H, and I'll do O H. And over here, I'll do OH, H, H, H. This guy is glucose. This is the open chain form of glucose. If you remember, if you have a carbon atom, it's going to Well, I'll do it better this way. There you go. It's going to have a 109 degree angle because if you took a marshmallow and put four sticks in it as far from each other as possible, you would stumble onto this particular bond angle. If you were told to put them as far from each other as possible, you'd stumble onto 109.5. The next carbon is here and the next carbon's here. So carbons go up and down. That's a long chain of carbons. This guy right here, these two are sticking out, these two are sticking out, these two are going back. If this is going back, and this is going back, and this is going back, and this is going back, the molecule looks more like a centipede that's curled over. And it can cyclize. It can cyclize. It can become a ring. So what does that tell you? Well, I'll show you glucose in its ring form. We've done this already, but it's okay. Now we're officially doing carbohydrates. It'd be wrong of me not to. CH2OH, and I'll make this one go down, and I'll make this one go down, and I'll make this one go up, and I'll make this one go down. So this is an alpha glucose because of the position of that OH going down. If this was going up, it was the beta glucose. And I talked about starch and cellulose. So starch is a long chain of alpha glucoses. With that in mind, this open chain, this is called the Fisher projection. Because whatever is going across horizontally is sticking out, and these are going back. But that's the Fisher projection. It cyclizes. This is the Hawthorne ring. So, when I keep saying to you, what's the monomer of starch? Glucose is the monomer of starch. And when you have, let's say that's carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four. If you have another glucose linking from carbon one to carbon four, the next, they go down like this. And I was showing the alpha one, four linkage. And your body can break the alpha 1,4 linkage. 
If it's beta glucosis, it's in your old notes, it can't break that. So this right here, this paper is actually chains of glucosis. My shirt, if it's cotton, is chains of glucosis. So, but they're uh, beta linked and I can't eat it, but a moth can eat it or a termite can eat it. Now, I got up at 4 a.m. and I had to drive my uh, wife to work. So it's probably 8 a.m. in the morning or something right now while I'm teaching this at an empty school on a Sunday. But that's part of being me. I ironed my shirt at 5 a.m. And when I ironed my shirt, I sprayed a lot of starch on it. And why do you spray a lot of starch? Because you're adding glucose back to a glucose-based shirt. Your clothes will last a lot longer if you actually take care of them, okay? So if you notice, I take my suit jacket off when I drive. I don't want to break the back of the coat. Long story. All right, getting past that, what can we do with this? Let me mention something about this chain real quickly. If I were to change this OH just here, that's a galactose. Sugars and in oats. The definition of sugars, aside from being sweet tasting, so now I've changed this to galactose, which would not cyclize to a glucose, it would cyclize to a galactose. But let me show you another one of these. Open chain form, CH2OH, and then right here, I'll put a carbonyl type group, ketone, and then H, then OH, and then OH, and then go over here, H, H, and why do I want to hold this? Because I don't want to mess up these structures because the positioning is insane to remember. This is a fructose. If you have high fructose corn syrup, like if you have sucrose, that's a disaccharide, we already did this, of a glucose and a fructose cane sugar, but they all end in oats. What would be the definition of a, of a carbohydrate? A carbohydrate is a poly, poly means many, hydroxy, aldehyde, or ketone. These are both carbohydrates polyhydroxy, alcohol, that's a hydroxy, alcohol, that's a hydroxy, one, two, three, four, five hydroxies, polyhydroxy, this guy up here, I know you're only memorizing it, or you're not memorizing it, but you're getting it somewhere for the exams, it's a lot easier if you just get him from these notes, but this is an aldehyde, so this would be an aldose sugar, Over here, this is a polyhydroxy aldehyde. This is a polyhydroxy one, two, three, four, five, but a ketone. So this is a keto sugar. So you got, um, if you do like a lab on diabetes or something, people are always trying to figure out their keto levels and their ketone levels and things like that. We're not talking about a keto diet. All right, that takes care of a little bit of these glucoses, starches, and celluloses. I want to talk about this guy. I guess I'll put him over here. Lactose is a disaccharide. So it's got two different sugars in it. 
It's got a glucose and a galactose. So that's a glucose bonded to a galactose. Whereas a sucrose, table sugar, that I said was a glucose bonded to a fructose. What breaks that down for you? In science, enzymes do something. Enzymes do something. How are they named? Enzymes are named after what they work on. And what they work on is called a substrate. So this is going to seem weird, but I'm going to do my best. Let's say I have an eraser sitting right here on my arm. It's sitting right there. And I have something move the eraser from this part of my arm to that part of my arm. The eraser would be the substrate. The enzyme would be the thing that looks nothing like the substrate that moves the eraser from one part of my arm to another. So if this is an eraser, the enzyme that moves it would be called move eraser ace. So enzymes end in ace. But they're named after their substrate except for you put the letters ASE. They look nothing like their substrates. Once again, my eraser, the thing that moves it, the enzyme that moves it is move eraser ACE. Really bad example, okay? So over here, you could break up sucrose. You have to break it up because your brain needs the glucose. You will break that up with sucrase. Sucrase probably looks nothing like sugar. It's just a molecule that can snap that for you. This is lactose. This is milk sugar. Back to milk again. You break up that bond with lactase and some people don't have that enzyme. So it doesn't mean that they don't want to be in the presence of lactase to say they're lack, I'm sorry, lactose. These people are lactose intolerant. Doesn't mean they're mad at lactose. But it just means their bodies get stomach aches if they eat a lot of milk sugars because they cannot break that down. We can all break down. We just genetically, some of us don't have this particular thing. So I want you to know that enzymes do something in your body. OK, and what they do basically is uh, they work on some substrate and they're named after the substrate. So or they have a more generic name. If they transfer something, they're a group of transfer aces. OK, but in this case, this was called lactase. You could assume it must work on lactose. I hope that makes sense. And actually, that's kind of important. Because what happens is the world expects you to know this stuff, oddly enough, like people must understand that lipids are some kind of fat. Because when you look in the commercials for fat burning, right? Like, let's say someone is burning fat. They say, take lipase pills. I'm not saying you should take lipase pills, but it always surprises me in the news. I'm like, on the TV, they're selling called lipase. Somehow they must think you had enough science to understand it works on lipids, it works on fat. Maybe you don't, but that's what they call it, okay? These things don't work. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Let's see where we're at on time. Ah, at this point, I think I'll take a break. And then I'll do the second 40.
45 minutes or so of this show. This show.